Welcome back. This is part three of a beginner's guide to shooting video. In this video, it's nothing but stabilization, the next important piece of your video puzzle. If you haven't seen part one or part two yet, go back and check those out so that you know where we're at. I went over cameras and lenses in part one, audio and lighting in part two. So the next most important piece of gear beyond everything that I went over in part one and part two is your tripod. If you're new to video, you might not realize just how important tripods are and how much of a difference there is between cheap and high quality ones. Since you're a beginner, you might not know what IBIS is. IBIS stands for in-body image stabilization. In-body image stabilization deals with stabilization that takes place within your camera. If you're shooting with a camera that has no in-body stabilization, and especially if you pair it with a lens that has no IS or image stabilization, your footage is going to be shaky and nearly unusable. Which leads me into my next point of the difference between OIS, optical image stabilization, and IBIS. The way that optical image stabilization works is it's built directly into the lens. That means that the image is stabilized before the light ever hits the sensor. Optical image stabilization goes by various names. In Canon, it's called IS for image stabilization. In Nikon, it's VR for vibration reduction. Panasonic, Lumix, and Leica are power OIS. Sigma is optical stabilization, OS. Sony is optical steady shot, OSS. And Tamron is vibration compensation, VC. You get the maximum benefit whenever you pair a lens that has OIS with a camera that has IBIS. That gives you five axis body stabilization. Even if you do have image stabilization, it's meant as more of a correction to shaky moments of video as opposed to stabilizing an entire video. Now don't get me wrong, if you're planning on shooting with a GoPro for example, especially the latest few versions of GoPros, then you don't need a tripod. GoPros have hyper smooth technology that is ridiculously smooth, but that's not what you're going to find in most DSLRs or any cinema cameras. The entire reason a GoPro has such good smoothing is because it's a dedicated action camera and that's something that they've really focused on and really excelled in. So if you're shooting on anything other than a GoPro, let's say you're shooting on a DSLR or a mirror Mirrorless. mirrorless cameras are small and they're lightweight. Even then you're going to want a tripod. So listen up fellas, doesn't matter how strong you think you are, your footage is still going to be shaky if you're shooting handheld. Strength doesn't really have anything to do with it. So going back to my protest example that I used in my previous videos, you're used to seeing footage from a protest as being shaky. So in an instance like that, if you take your camera out and you throw a shotgun mic on there, people are going to expect that your footage isn't going to look buttery smooth movie quality. You're going to have shake, you're going to have shakiness to your footage, but if you have clients or you're planning on shooting weddings, you're going to need a tripod and a stabilizer to make sure that you get those buttery smooth shots. The main functions of tripods are to hold your camera, position your camera, and allow smooth tilting and panning. That's where the quality of tripods comes in. So I have a slew of tripods here. I'm not going to get into the specifics of what each one is, what model each one is. I'm just going to tell you the differences between a cheap tripod, like this plastic little thing, and a nice carbon fiber tripod, or a heavy duty tripod like this. You have a little tiny handheld one like this. I have used my 1DX Mark II, my really heavy camera with this thing. I've sat in the back of cars and held it like this. It's not perfect, but it's cheap. I think this was like 25 bucks. Now a tripod like this, the Joby, I call this a gorilla tripod. In part one of this series, I showed you footage from the video where I lived in a tree for three days and I use this, I wrap this around the branches. I use this throughout my entire shoot. I have two of them, put my GoPro on one. I put uh, my little Sony RX100 Mark VII on there and also my phone and I use these all the time. These things are invaluable. Highly recommend buying one of these. Moving on to the more traditional tripod that you're used to seeing. The only reason that I have this is because I was in a pinch and I had to run to a Walmart, a 24 hour Walmart the night before a shoot to get a uh, crappy little plastic tripod like this. If you're trying to make a living in video, I would not recommend getting a cheap tripod like this. The only reason I got this is because I was in a pinch or if you are running to you know your kids sporting events and you need a tripod really quick and you have a little lightweight camcorder something like this is fine but if you're shooting on a dslr or anything heavier it's not going to cut it it's going to break over time so you need something more expensive more valuable so now let's move on up to the only tripod that I'm gonna mention the model of, this is the Manfrotto Be Free Live Carbon Fiber. This is my favorite tripod I've ever owned because it's so lightweight and so compact. The cool thing about this one is it folds up like this, cut out any excess length, super lightweight. It's only 2.42 pounds. You can pack it up in your camera bag if you have a big enough camera bag. Carbon fiber is lighter weight, holds more weight, and lasts longer. So I paid more money to get the carbon fiber version, but I really recommend doing that. This is like the perfect travel tripod. If you're hiking and you just have a DSLR to shoot with, 
This is perfect to use for both photos and videos. All right, now moving on past that, getting into a bigger type of tripod. This thing is super stable. As you can see, it has two legs going down each side. This is my first tripod that I had. It has a big giant uh, plate on it to make sure that your camera, uh, even a larger camera is super stable. And it has a nice fluid tripod head that came with it. That's another thing as a beginner that you might not know. Tripod heads don't always come with tripods. Whenever you buy a cheaper tripod, the head is usually attached to it, but when you get into the more expensive tripods, there are a lot of different options that you can use as a tripod head, depending on what you need. So, this is the tripod head, and this is the tripod by itself. This is a nice fluid drag system. You can get nice panning and tilting shots with this. I just barely touch it with my finger right here when I have the settings right, and it gets a nice smooth panning shot. Nice tilting shot. So for example, when I showed you this tripod earlier that I said was my favorite tripod ever, you can see the difference in the tripod head. So this is a small tripod head because I was trying to keep this one lightweight. And whenever you put the camera on this one, I have to hold onto the camera itself to get a panning shot. And you just don't get the smoothest shots doing it that way unless you're really good. It takes some practice. So beyond tripods, you have monopods. As the name suggests, it's literally just one tripod leg that you mount your camera onto. These are often used for photographers. If you look on an NFL sideline, for example, and you see the photographers with those huge lenses, those telephoto lenses, they'll have a monopod underneath with the lens mounted to it so that they can not only hold the camera, but also use it as a stabilizer. And also it gives them a rest. Otherwise they'd have to be holding that heavy lens all day long. All right, that's the super basics of tripods. You can go from little handheld ones like this to bigger ones like this, to movie quality cinema ones that are huge and super expensive, just like with the rest of video gear. But you gotta look at your returns on investment. So if you buy a super expensive tripod, is it really worth it for the investment that you're getting back? Do you have a camera that it's even necessary to do that for? So moving beyond tripods and monopods and Keurig pods, we're getting into a whole other world of stabilization. So let's talk about the Steadicam, which was invented in 1975 by Garrett Brown. So Garrett Brown was a cameraman that was searching for ways to operate heavy cameras smoothly without becoming exhausted. So he invented the Steadicam. It incorporated a vest and an arm that would support the camera on a gimbal arrangement. The arm also isolated the camera from vibrations, allowing the operator to walk while the camera floated. So fast forwarding from the 1970s to the early 2010s, you now have motorized gimbal stabilizers, which is what a huge majority of shooters use. So these work by measuring the camera's position hundreds of times per second, and when it detects a movement, it engages motors to move an equal degree in the opposite direction, thereby negating the shake. This right here is my DJI Osmo. You pair this with a cell phone. Turn it on. And as you can see, it stabilizes the footage. It has controllers on it. I can pan, I can tilt. With the click of a button, I can also rotate it from portrait to landscape. When I walk up and down, it stabilizes it. If you're doing any type of Facebook Live video, I would highly recommend getting something like this. Moving past that, this is the H2 Pilot Fly. This is just a bigger version of what I just showed you. This is a one-handed stabilizer, and you pair this with like your 5D Mark IV, your mirrorless cameras. Moving beyond that, you have two-handed, like the DJI Ronin II, which is kind of an industry standard with some of these smaller shoots that people do. These stabilizers are not what I would call a necessity, like the cameras and lenses in part one and the audio and lighting in part two, which is a necessity. If you're wanting to separate your footage from beginners and you're wanting to get nice, smooth shots, that uh, you can't figure out how to get those shots probably because you don't have a stabilizer. So it's kind of one of those things where the better you are, the less it's appreciated because you don't notice it. But when you do notice shaky footage or you do notice wobbly footage from one of these things, that's where you can see the difference and that's where it's separated. That is the basics of all this stuff. In part four, I'm gonna talk about having your own little YouTube studio or your office set up because you're going to need one of those if you're wanting to do video. Thanks for watching. Check out part one and part two if you haven't yet. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in part four.